Wow, what an introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, again, I'm, my name is Risa Milne. I'm a recovered alcoholic. My sobriety date is March 3rd, 2004. And my home group is the primary purpose group of Webster, New York. We meet on Sunday mornings at 9.30 Eastern time on Zoom. So we, uh, we would love to have everybody show up and it is a big book study and we love to, to study the big book um, of Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, so, and I'm just, I'm so thankful to be able to be of service. I, um, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I love our program of action. I love our steps. I love everything about it. Um, and that was not something that was true my whole sobriety. Um, it, it wasn't even true maybe just a few years ago, but um, I've been able to have um, yet another personality um, another spiritual awakening and, and that personality change that comes along with the spiritual awakening. And so um, I don't want to spend too much time on my story of drinking, um, but I, I do recognize the importance of um, qualifying myself. So um, I'm going to start when I first walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, much like um, other people, um, other, other women, sometimes, um, I came in as a support for my boyfriend. Um, I didn't have a problem at the time he did. He stole money from me and I told him he needed to get sober or that was it. And, um, now at the same time, I was going in and out of hospitals with alcoholic seizures. I was unable to go out into public, regardless if I was sober, regardless if I was drunk, regardless if I was on anything, because I was terrified of my own shadow. Um, <clears throat> I was trying to um, continue to utilize alcohol as a solution, and it was no longer um, being that solution anymore. However, as delusional as I usually am, um, I didn't have a problem. He did. And, and as I saw it, he needed help. And as we were sitting in the room of Alcoholics Anonymous, that first meeting, I sat and listened to the people talking about um, their lives and, and opening up and sharing. And there was a moment, a moment where there was this thought in my head that said, maybe you should be here too. Um, and I didn't know. So, so I started going to meetings um, regularly and I didn't know what, what an alcoholic was. I didn't know if I was an alcoholic. I knew that the people who were in those rooms sounded a lot like me, like the, the, they sounded as miserable as I was, but they had hope, you know, they, they were happy, they were smiling, they were joyous, and I just wanted to feel better. And um, at this time, I didn't know if my problem was alcohol, I didn't know if it was other substances, I didn't know if I was just mental health issues and I just needed the right medication. I didn't know what was wrong with me. All I knew is that the people in Alcoholics Anonymous were happier than I was and I wanted that. And I would talk about not knowing if I was an alcoholic. And at these meetings, they um, nobody really ever talked about what an alcoholic was. What they did was they said things to me like, you'll do until a real alcoholic comes along. Um, they told me things like people don't show up in Alcoholics Anonymous by accident. They would, so they would say these things to me but nobody ever explained to me what an alcoholic was. And I was sitting in that room, I was 22 years old, around, surrounded by a lot of older people who had been homeless or been to prison or had you know, so many stints at a detox and rehab. And, and I thought that's what made somebody an alcoholic. And I was 22 and I still had my home and I still had my car because my mom was paying for them, but you know, I still, I still had these things. So I didn't think 
I had what it took to be an alcoholic because I still had these other things. And nobody really talked about the drinking part. They just talked about the consequences. And so what happened was um, I spent some time in Alcoholics Anonymous and they told me to get a sponsor. And I got a sponsor. And that sponsor met with me the first time um, I sat down with her and she said to me, if you're not an alcoholic, don't waste my time. So I didn't know if I was an alcoholic and she didn't seem like she was going to share with me what an alcoholic was. So I did not waste her time. And I just, you know, stopped talking to her. So then I found another sponsor who told me that she wouldn't work with me until I broke up with the boyfriend. And then I found another sponsor who said that she wouldn't work with me until I had a year sober. And, and this, you know, I continued to go through sponsor after sponsor who just kept putting off working these steps or telling me if I was an alcoholic or what was an alcoholic. And, and as this continued, I continued to get sicker and sicker. Um, when I was first coming in, I was very angry. I was still very anxious. I was terrified of you. I was terrified of my own shadow. I was not the person who walked into Alcoholics Anonymous and was like, I found my people. I, 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 that wasn't who I was. That's not my story. And what happened was at 10 months sober, I was thinking, if this is what sobriety is like, and I want to die worse than when I first walked into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, then I don't want any of this. I'm done. And uh, at that point, I, I picked up again. And right as I was picking up, I started to think to myself, like, I had already drank. <laughs> But as I was, as I was drinking down, um, I thought to myself, I don't want to go back to that life. I really, really don't want to go back to that life of every single day feeling like Groundhog's Day, every single day, you know, um, dragging my butt home at six in the morning, being um, completely and utterly feeling demoralized and that incomprehensible demoralization it talks about in that book and going to bed and thinking, I'm never going to do this ever again and waking up again and going to work and, and throwing out all my booze. And, and by the time I get to work, I'm already starting to think, all right, where am I going to get more booze? Where am I going to get more money to get that booze? Um, and just doing it over and over and over and over again. And as I was drinking, I did not get drunk. I happened that voice, which was not my own. It was not my own voice in my head at that time really hit me. And I was still in my pajamas and I got out of the house and I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous drunk, uh, not drunk, but drinking. And um, somebody there, it was, it was the time of Rochester's convention, Rochester, New York, we have a convention in March. And it was the time of the convention. And somebody said to me, you know, why don't you get up to the convention? Why don't you get yourself into service and get out of yourself a little bit? And you might find a sponsor who will work with you. So I went up to the convention. Now I still don't know if I'm an alcoholic. I still don't know what's wrong with me. I just know I'm miserable and I don't want to drink anymore. And so I go up to this convention and there's a friend of mine there um, that she and I, like she and I used to sit in the back of these meetings and make fun of big book thumpers. You know, we used to, <laughs> we used to call them, you know, like all sorts of names and we'd roll our eyes at them and they seemed crazy. And, and we used to, we used to sit in the back and, and we were both angry and just like, did not like anybody. We didn't like happy people too much. And, um, and we would make fun of them. And I saw her at this convention and she looked happy for like, like for real happy. Like you could see it in her eyes. She, she looked calm. She looked happy. And, um, and I went up to her. I was like, wait, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you look happy. And, uh, she looked at me and she said, I went through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with my sponsor. And I was just kind of, I was, 
I was thrown back. I was like, what? <laughs> and uh, I thought, we don't like that book. We don't, we don't want to go through that book. And she's like, she told me that she had hit a wall in sobriety and that she had found a sponsor who had taken her through the book. And I was just kind of like, ah, whatever, like you're crazy. And so I continued on with my, my weekend and it's the convention and you're around in a convention, anyone who's been in a convention setting, like the, the energy and the spirit are very contagious. And I got very excited about being sober and I was very happy. And I, I enjoyed myself a lot. It was the first time I really enjoyed myself while sober. And then Sunday hit and I went home and I spent the night with my two cats And I felt more miserable and more alone than I did in, in days. And, um, and I was just like, this is awful. This is awful. And, uh, I stayed sober and I went to a meeting that Wednesday and I walked into the meeting and there was that same friend and she was still happy. (laughs) She was still happy. And I was like, what? like the convention's over. You don't need to fake it anymore. Like you don't like, like this is, you know, like you can be normal again. You can be, you know, like your angry self again. She said, I told you, I went through the big book with my sponsor and I sat there through the meeting and I like watched her and she really looked genuinely happy. And after that, I walked up to her and I asked her, could she do the same thing for me? And she said, absolutely. And uh, she gave me a few things I needed to do. Um, I had to be at her house on Sundays, starting that Sunday at six at 6.30 p.m. We would get go through the book for an hour and then we would continue to her home group, which was going to be my home group. And um, and she she helped me become a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that woman is the first person to ever tell me what an alcoholic is. And so um, the way I like to look at what alcoholism is, because I think it's, um, I think it's crazy that um, I was going to meetings for over a year, not knowing what an alcoholic was. I was going to these meetings where I knew what problems happened in halfway houses. Um, I knew what happened if, or what you were supposed to do if your cat died or you got diagnosed with cancer, but I didn't know what alcoholism was. And I didn't know, um, I didn't know if I was an alcoholic and it was really important for me to know if I was an alcoholic, because if I had what you had, then what you did would work for me. And that was really, really important for me to know. And so in our big book, it talks to us about what an alcoholic is. In the doctor's opinion, there's this really good um, paragraph that the doctor, Dr. Silkworth, talks about. It's on um, our page in in the fourth fourth edition, fourth edition, um, XXVIII. And um, this is at the beginning of of this page, the doctor is explaining what is an allergy. Um, and, and this allergy, when I first found out, like I have an allergy to alcohol, I was like, that's insane. That's absolutely like, I don't have an allergy. I have an allergy to ragweed. You know, when there's a lot of ragweed around, I, I get this like stuffy nose. I'm sneezing like ridiculously. My eyes are getting red and watery. I want to sleep all day long. And, uh, and that's what an allergy looks like. And, um, and what I found out is that the word allergy back when this book was written wasn't in the medical dictionary yet. It wasn't a medical word. So all it really meant was that there was something wrong with my body. And so what happens when I put alcohol in my body is my body reacts differently than what happens. Um, and I always use my mother-in-law. My mother-in-law is, is a social drinker. Um, I don't have social drinkers in my family, so I don't know what that looks like, but, um, she's, she's, she will pick up a glass of wine, um, on Thanksgiving or holiday, or when we're having a, a get together, she'll, she'll pick up a glass of wine and she'll drink half of it down. And, and she'll start saying things like, I'm feeling it. 
or I'm getting a headache. I'm going to put this down. And she puts it down and she might even forget where she put it. I don't, I know exactly where it is at the whole entire time. <laughs> um, and, and, and I'm paying attention to her drinking. I mean, like, I'm just, I'm, it's crazy, but so, so she's thinking these things. And, and I just think in my head, like, no, Ann, you got to push through that. Like you got to push through that to the other side, then you'll get the real effects of the alcohol. So, um, so what happens to me though, is when I put alcohol in my body, what happens is that I can't stop. And I don't think I can, I can't stop. I think I can. What happened was I worked um, C shift at my job. And so oftentimes my girlfriends would go out. I'd have to be at work at 11 o'clock at night. And my girlfriends would be going out at five or six and they'd invite me out. And I'd say, sure, I'm going to come out. I'll just have one, you know? And so I, I go and I, and I'm going with complete, complete, um, I am going to get one drink and then I'm going to be responsible and I'm going to go to my job because my boss has already told me if I call in one more time, I'm fired. And if I get fired, I'm going to have to ask my mom for more money. And asking my mom for more money is very humiliating. And what excuse am I going to come up with again for her to even give me the more money? So these are all the things that are running through my head. And I go into that bar stone cold sober desperately not wanting to drink like not drink but to get drunk I do not want to get drunk I want to go to work that night and I go up to the bar and I get a drink and as I'm starting to drink that drink down my mind starts to say you know what two isn't gonna hurt you you know two isn't gonna hurt you too bad so why don't you have just one more. One more is okay. And I go and I order another drink. And what happens is, is I start to think, you know what? I'm really having a good time. And I haven't hang out with my girls in a while. And, you know, maybe there's one more excuse I can think of for me not to go to work, you know? And, and so the next thing I know is I'm drinking. I've, I've, you know, I'm drinking, I'm starting to calculate, you know, in my head, either, either these are the two things that happen. I start to calculate in my head how much time needs to go by between drinks and food. If I put food in my system, it'll calm the, the, the alcoholism down. I'll be able to still drive to work if I leave at this time and I'm doing that alcoholic math. Or what happens is I'm then sitting there thinking, okay, a few months ago, my aunt Betty died. Um, and I don't have an aunt Betty, but she died. <laughs> and, um, now who in my family hasn't died yet or passed away, or I need to go help or hasn't had an emergency that my boss will, will accept. You know, and those are the things that are going on in my head. And so what that allergy looks like is in my, like my body is physically unable to stop. But what it looks like is that either I just changed my mind or that I just need some extra time, you know, like I just need a little more time. So that's what that, that allergy looks like in, in my body. And there's more scientific, uh, tests now and stuff like that. You can read it all about it on like Google or something like that, but that's what it looked like to me. And so it's talking about that in the doctor's opinion, it talks about the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. So it's an allergy that, that, we don't really know how, like it, it just shows up. Okay. And that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average Trump temperate drinker. So a few things about that is I can only have the craving when the alcohol is in my body. I cannot have a craving for alcohol when there's no longer alcohol in my body. And the reason that that is important to know that that the craving and the obsession are two different things is because there's two different solutions there. 
If it's a craving, all I have to do is not drink. That's all I have to do. I put the plug in the jug and that's all I have to do. I don't drink. But what happens to me when I put the plug in the jug is I get worse. Like I'm one of those people where it's like, I stopped drinking. Why did I lose my job? You know, well, it's because I got worse. I'm, I'm angry. I'm become more selfish, more self-centered and, and I'm yelling at everybody and nobody's doing what I want. And I, I become, um, what it talks about down at the bottom of this page, men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. Well, I loved that effect. That effect was, was what made me a part of society. That effect is what made me be able to get through life. That effect was what made me not kill myself at 10 years old. Like that effect was amazing. It was an amazing, amazing feeling. And um, especially for someone who constantly felt like their life was wrong, you know, and the sensation is so elusive. What elusive means is something that I keep trying to get, but I cannot. So after I had that first sensation of this thing being my solution, every single time after it, I am trying to get back there. I am trying to get back to that state of solution from alcohol, you know, that, that alcohol is just going to ease it. But what happens because of that craving is I have this thought in my head, this alcohol is going to make it feel better. I put it into my body and then this craving happens that takes me way beyond the sensation that I'm going for. I like hit it after a few drinks, but my body needs more and more and more. And so I can never reach that sensation ever again. And I admit that it is injury. So yeah, I know that when this happens, bad things happen. However, I cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. My brain thinks about that first time, that first time I got that sensation. My brain goes back there and says, it's going to, this, this time it's going to make you feel better. This time, you're not going to go so far. This time, it's going to be different, you know, and um, to them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They are restless, irritable, and discontented. Stone cold sober. This is stone cold sober. I'm restless, irritable, and discontented. I feel like a tiger in a cage. I'm just walking back and forth, wanting to get out, being inside. <clears throat> I don't want to be inside when I'm inside, but I go outside and I don't want to be outside. I don't want to be with a bunch of people, but I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be, you know, I, I just can't be content. I can't, I don't feel right in my skin. I don't feel content and I just don't feel okay. And again, that thought comes creeping in. I know what's going to make this feel better, a drink. And eventually I'm going to get that sensation again. And I pick up the drink, the drink that <clears throat> comes at once by, uh, that I see others taking with impunity, without punishment. I see my girlfriends being able to drink the way they're drinking and they're not dealing with the same things I'm dealing with. And after I come to succumb to finally being like, you know what, I'm just picking it up. It's going to be fine this time. It's going to be different this time. Or, or I just don't care. I'm so miserable. I just don't care what the consequences are. That, de that craving develops again. I end up in a spree. I get, I go past that sensation that is elusive that I am going for. And I end up walking up my driveway at 6 a.m. with some pretty bad, incomprehensible demoralization, thinking I'm never, ever, ever going to do that again. And, you know, I, I was listening to a speaker one day and she had asked, you know, what is the worst thing? Um, that you ever did drinking, you know, the worst, worst, worst thing that ever happened when drinking. 
And, um, and, and I thought about it and I, I encourage you guys to all think about it. Um, the worst, worst, worst thing that ever happened because of drinking. And I was drinking the next day, you know, I was drinking the next day. That really horrible thing did not keep me from drinking. And on page 24, it talks about that. It says at a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. And so going through this book and going through the doctor's opinion and going through Bill's story and there's a solution and more about alcoholism, my sponsor got me to believe to my innermost self that I was an alcoholic. And uh, it needed to be, um, it needed to be a, a, an emotional bottom uh, not an emotional, uh, it, it's not an exercise in mental um, capacity. I can't think myself into being an alcoholic. I need to have the experience for myself of the first step. And so she helped me take a look at my drinking and she helped me take a look at my life. And she helped me to have the experience of the first step. And I was able to finally open my eyes and say, I am an alcoholic. And with that, I was able to go with a gusto. And, and once I realized that I was powerless over putting alcohol in my body and that I was powerless over picking it up in the first place, I went with a gusto through these steps. Um, I followed every word she told me. I did the directions. I did, I did complain a little and I whined a little here and there. I mean, I'm, I wasn't, I wasn't like super sponsy, but I did follow the directions and I pretty much did whatever she asked me to with a little whining. Um, and eventually at step 12, Actually, it was at step 10, I realized when I was reading the promises of step 10, which um, I will read for you. Um, all right. Um, these promises, we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, sanity will return. What I realized was I hadn't thought about alcohol at all. Like by the time I got to this paragraph, it hit me square between the eyes. I haven't thought about alcohol at all. And I was like, wow. Like I, I was just like, because I heard the ninth step promises all the time. But this was the first time I heard the 10th step promises. And I was like, wow, these things are true. Like this is happening. And I was so excited. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. I thought that I was going to always be a recovering alcoholic. I thought that I was going to always have to be hanging on to this rope as tight as I could or knuckle grabbing the, the counter or something. I thought I was going to never be able to go down the cookie aisle at the grocery store because the beer was on the other side. That's what I thought alcohol, that my life was going to look like. And what this looked like was completely different. I walked around alcohol everywhere and I wasn't affected by it at all. I didn't think about it. I didn't think about drinking it. I didn't think about not drinking it. It just wasn't a thing anymore. And so therefore I had recovered at this point from a hopeless state of mind and body. And I was just amazed and I fell in love. And what happened next was I went ranting and raving all over all the meetings in Rochester, New York, letting everybody know that there is a solution on Alcoholics Anonymous in the book and that they were all doing it wrong. <laughs> and um, I, I was 
thumping a book. I was pounding my fist. I was very excited and very unattractively bringing our program to the rest of Alcoholics Anonymous. I was, um, I was still full of myself. I was still prideful. I was still egotistical. Um, The only difference was I was not drinking. And what happened was I got through these steps and for reasons um, out of my control, I ended up with different sponsor and um, I did not continue to work our last three steps. I did not continue to do step 10, step 11, and step 12. And I became very miserable. And I'm not going to go into all of it. But what I can tell you is that year 16, which was 2020, March 2020, I was going to drink again. Um, I got to a point I was taking people through the book. I was still going to meetings talking about the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, And what I needed you to, I needed you to see this persona of me and what it was, was I didn't practice any of what is in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I tried to teach it. Um, I did not try to learn anymore because I already knew it all. You know, I had gone through the book thousands of times and I knew what it said backwards and forwards and left and right. And I knew what the words were and I knew what it meant. And what happened was at 16 years sober, I was staying sober on self-knowledge alone. And that was it. And I thought I had become powerful over alcohol again. And I no longer had a relationship with a higher power. And I no longer had a relationship with Alcoholics Anonymous. I was above Alcoholics Anonymous. And I got to a place where I was so miserable and I was leading this fake false life to everybody, including myself. And I had become so delusional that I had so much control over my drinking, over my thinking, over my selfishness, over over God, that I thought the only possible way for Alcoholics Anonymous and these steps to work ever again in my life was to drink again because I, I don't know how to reset. And what happened was there was a shutdown and there was quarantine. And what happened was I got worse. I got worse and I was alone in this house, in my house with my children, trying to do 8,000 things. And I was alone for the first time with my creator. And I was terrified because I didn't have a good relationship with him. And I was looking at hand sanitizer in my car, wanting to squirt it into my mouth. And I came very close to doing that. Um, However, Zoom saved me. Um, The Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous came into my house. And one night I was upstairs in my room and I let um, my husband know that I was done for the week. He had to take over. Um, I was done being with my kids and I was going to sleep all weekend long. And I was just, that's how, where I was. I didn't want to be married. I didn't want to be a mother. I didn't want to be any of these things anymore. I wanted to run away and just drink the rest of my life away. And um, he came running upstairs um, with the computer because there was a woman sharing her story who almost took a drink when she had double years of sobriety. And I listened to her and she was so excited and she loved Alcoholics Anonymous and she loved the big book. And I got so excited about this woman. And she told the the group what her her, uh, home group was. And Ryan, my husband had already been going to that group for a few weeks on Zoom. Um, and he'd ask me if I wanted to go and I'd be like, nah, I don't want to go. I don't want to go to a meeting, you know? And, um, 
I listened to this woman. I went to that meeting and they were reading the book and they were doing this study. And I read, they started in, uh, where I started with them was in the fourth step and they were reading. And I looked at my husband and I said, what book are they reading from? Because I've never heard this before in my whole entire life. And I became amazed and open and willing and honest again to realize I did not know what the heck I was doing. And uh, after going to that meeting for a little bit, I realized I needed, I did not have an experience the way that I, I, I have not experienced the steps the way the big book talks about. I thought steps 10 and 11 were optional. They are not optional. This is a 12 step program. That means I need to do all 12 of those steps. I need to do them regularly because without taking a regular look at myself, I cannot become close to God. I cannot stay open. I cannot stay, um, I cannot stay free of the selfishness and self-centeredness that, that it talks about on pages 60 to 62. That is me. I thought that, I thought that went away once you finished the steps. I thought that selfishness was gone after you finished the steps. I was shocked to realize that's me on a daily basis on a daily basis, not on these big giant things that I'm selfish on, but the fact that my husband doesn't like the dinner I cooked and I'm going to make it all about me. It's crazy. And so I was listening to the, I'm going to this big book study and I know I need a sponsor who goes through the book this way. And so I reached out and they gave me the name and the number of a woman who lives in Kansas city. And I have not actually been in the same room as my sponsor, but she has been the woman who has worked with me for the last year and a half. And she has brought me through this book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And she has brought me into a way of living, which has been miraculous. And I have had an experience with God that I never, ever thought was going to be possible for me. And I have been reborn. And I have been that, I can't ever say that I have been in love with Alcoholics Anonymous as much as I can today. I have become free of all of the craziness in my head on a regular basis as long, and here's, here's the, the part that's important as long as I continually stay close to God and perform his work well. My primary purpose today, after having a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, is to be of service to my God and to be useful to the people about me. And as long as I am doing that, and as long as I'm clearing myself up with 10 and 11, and continuing to try my best to live these principles on a daily basis in all my affairs, I will continue to be able to be free and to be in love with Alcoholics Anonymous every single day. It's a wonderful program. There is a solution here for us. It is an amazing, amazing thing. And uh, for that, I am completely and utterly grateful to be able to be here to share that freedom with others and to be of service to anyone um, who is looking for any support. I am available to sponsor and I will put my name and number in the chat after I am done. Thank you so much, Joseph, for asking me to come and share and I love you all. Thank you.